Hello everyone, welcome back. This is the third episode of Cochran, Thomas Cochran, British Outcast, the South American Hero. We've already done the first two. I have this shitty cookies and cream porter. And I don't want to drink it, but I'm going to for this video because I am a trooper. In 1809, Lord Thomas Cochrane was on top of the world, enjoying fame and notoriety across Europe. He was known as Britain's most daring captain and a scourge to Napoleonic France. Scourge. However, fame is a fickle thing, and yep. Cochrane soon found himself Ugh. crashing down to earth. In this episode, we join him at his lowest moment as a prisoner in King's Bench Prison. Scourge. But Cochrane would soon Ugh. hit his stride once more upon unexpected horizons on a faraway continent. This video is brought to you by our kind patrons and channel members. The economic downturn caused by the pandemic decreased our earnings by 40%, but thanks to our supporters on if you want to support us, get these perks and join their ranks. Click on the link in the pinned comment or the join button under the video. If you click on my um, uh, like and subscribe, then it's practically like clicking their buttons. So it's all the same. In 1815, Napoleon was finally defeated at Waterloo and his demise brought an end to the war that had defined the entirety of Cochrane's naval career, but the disgraced Scotsman was unable to bask in this glory, having been left to rot in prison. Never one to accept his fate, Cochrane escaped from King's Bench in March of 1815, scaling down the prison walls from a three-story window using a contraband rope. Okay. Instead of fleeing, he went to Westminster, and demanded his seat in the House of Commons, where he had served before his unceremonious conviction in the Great Stock Exchange. Real fast, if you're an American, just imagine Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. They escape and then return to their place and be like, hey, look, I should be back in office. And you'd be like, what? First off, they never held office, but you'd be like, uh, no, dude, you're not good. I'm not comparing him to them, but I'm just comparing prisoner escaping Pablo Escobar. That's a good example. Oh, there's a net there. I got to kill it. Back to the video. Fraud. Unsurprisingly, he was promptly arrested and thrown back into jail. Yeah. Cochrane was released in June upon finishing his sentence and rejoined his family. I missed. In the years since his resignation from the Royal Navy, he had married a woman named Kitty and they had a son, Thomas Jr. In 1818, Cochrane was approached by the representative of Chile in London, Don Jose Alvarez. At this time, Chile was a rebel nation fighting for its freedom against Spain. The aftermath of Napoleon's demise saw much of South America rise in open rebellion against the Spanish Empire fighting in wars made iconic by the likes of Simon Bolivar, who at present was engaged in a struggle to establish republics in Colombia and Bolivia. Chile had enjoyed much success in this regard. Under the leadership of the General José de San Martín and the Irish-descended commander Bernardo O'Higgins, much of inland Chile had been liberated. Bernardo However, at sea, the Spanish were still strong. <coughs> Held up in the highly fortified coastal fortresses from Peru to Patagonia, they threatened the new republic with a counter-revolutionary strike. Ambassador Alvarez had specifically sought out Cochrane and implored him on behalf of the commander-in-chief of the Chilean Republic, O'Higgins, to assume command of the Chilean Navy and drive the Spanish from their coasts. On August 15, 1818, Cochrane departed for Chile with his family. On November 29th, Cochrane came upon the docks of Valparaiso, the provisional capital of the Republic. Soon he was introduced to the Chilean Navy. It was not much, consisting merely of three frigates, three brigs and a sloop. The largest ship was a 50-gunner, O'Higgins, named after Chile's commander-in-chief. Oh, Cochrane made this vessel into his flagship. On January 16th, 1819, Cochrane set sail upon his first South American campaign. 
To his great irritation, he found out that his five-year-old son had enthusiastically stowed himself aboard his flagship. Oh no! By the time the child had been discovered, it was too late to turn back. He begrudgingly allowed his son to stay aboard, where the sailors outfitted the boy as a midshipman. One of the Spanish fortresses in the region was the harbour town of Callao, where Spanish ships could resupply their soldiers under the protection of a massive beachfront fortress. Cochrane made Callao his target, for he had received intel that the two most powerful frigates in the Spanish fleet, Esmeralda and Venganza, were anchored there. In February, they arrived at the town, which conveniently was celebrating a carnival. Cochrane's plan was to cut into the harbour with two of his warships while the town was distracted by the festivities, board the two Spanish frigates, and make off with them as a prize. Yet, as the O'Higgins and Lautaro made forth, a thick fog blanketed the rocky anchorage, making it far too dangerous to approach and costing them valuable time. The fog soon lifted, revealing the Chilean advance to the 350 guns stationed on the nearby fortress. Fully manned and ready to unleash hell, it turned out that Callao had not been as taken by merriment as they had hoped. Lautaro quickly listed off to safety, leaving Cochrane aboard the O'Higgins to bear the brunt of the oncoming cannonade. The Scotsman immediately made maneuvers to veer out of range, but to his horror, he saw his toddler son run on deck, enthusiastic to join in the action. A Spanish cannonball whizzed over the deck, blowing off the head of a nearby marine and splattering Tiny Tom in blood. Cochrane stood paralyzed in terror until the child shouted, I am not hurt, Papa, the ball did not touch me. Cochrane quickly tacked his vessel out of cannon range, all the while ordering his son to be carried back below. Not wanting to miss the action, Tom struggled and screamed until he was allowed to stay. The O'Higgins managed to escape with little damage. Unfazed, Cochrane engaged in an exchange of prisoners with the fortress, trading captives he had taken from a royalist gunboat for indentured Chileans. During these talks, the Spanish Viceroy demanded to know why a British officer would serve a nation of continental rebels. Cochrane replied, A British nobleman is a free man, capable of judging between right and wrong, and at liberty to adopt a country and a cause which aim at restoring the rights of oppressed human nature. The Spaniards remembered all too well the terror that Cochrane had caused them aboard HMS Speedy 20 years earlier. Cochrane was pleased to hear that Spanish sailors had a nickname for him, El Diablo. <laughs> nice. Indestructible shoe! They are... Nice looking shoe. First thing I found Indestructible shows. Having exhausted all his avenues into Callao, Cochrane turns to the south and set his sights upon Valdivia. While O'Higgins respected Cochrane, he refused to lend him funds and manpower for an assault on that city, as it was widely considered to be the most impregnable redoubt in all South America. Chile would never be secure while Valdivia remained Spanish, but attacking it was considered suicide. But Cochrane never cared about the odds. So in December of 1819, the Sea Wolf sailed southwards with only his flagship, fully intending to take on Latin America's most fortified stronghold alone. On January 17th of 1820, the O'Higgins arrived at Coral Bay, an estuary upon which seven heavily garrisoned fortresses stood firm. These land batteries formed the main obstacle between Cochrane and the city of Baldivia proper, which lay 16 miles upriver. Success was paramount, both to maintain the Sea Wolf's near-mythic reputation and to stay in good graces with the Chilean government. Luckily, the campaign got off to a good start. Cochrane had employed his classic false flag technique, flying Spanish colors in the bay. When the royalist brig Patrillo listed towards the shore, she was promptly deceived and captured. Aboard Patrillo was $20,000 and a highly detailed sea chart of the harbour of Baldivia. Having performed a satisfactory reconnaissance, the O'Higgins sailed up the coast and travelled to Talcahuano Bay, where the local Chilean governor levied 250 men for the Sea Wolf's cause. Cochrane also managed to recruit the services of two schooners, the Montezuma and Intrepido. Together, they sailed southwards once more, 
knowing that 350 sailors in three wooden ships were about to face down 2,000 soldiers stationed across seven fortresses of stone. Uh -oh. After being briefly run aground by a rogue wind on the island of Kiriquina, the O'Higgins managed to get back afloat through some vigorous bilge pumping and Cochrane's personal carpentry skills. However, the ship remained damaged, and the water that flooded the hull had ruined the powder magazine and most of the ammunition aboard. Undeterred, Cochrane simply convinced his crew they would find victory through use of their bayonets alone. The frigate rendezvoused back with the two schooners. The crew of the leaking O'Higgins was transferred to the Montezuma and Intrepido, both of whom docked just off Fort Ingles at the mouth of the river Valdivia, flying Spanish colours so not to alert the defenders inside. Cochrane had realised that most of the enemy fortresses were designed to repel a seaward assault, and a land attack might have the element of surprise. As he explained to his crew, operations unexpected by the enemy are, when well executed, almost certain to succeed, whatever may be the odds. On the afternoon of February 3rd, the Spaniards demanded the two vessels identify themselves. Cochrane sent an officer ashore to parley with the Spaniards in Fort Ingles, claiming they had been blown off course from a Spanish squadron rounding Cape Horn. The Spaniards didn't buy this story, and at precisely 4pm opened fire on Intrepido, breaching its hull and killing two soldiers. Uh -oh. Cochrane was forced to order the immediate commencement of his assault. To that aim, a vanguard was formed. 44 marines, led by English-born Major William Miller, were boarded upon a canoe and began a perilous approach upon the beach of Fort Ingles. The Spaniards sent out an advanced contingent of 75 soldiers, launching volley after volley of musket fire upon the Chilean boat. A handful of marines were killed, but the rowers pressed on bravely under fire. Eventually reaching the shore, Major Miller led a fierce bayonet charge upon the enemy, routing the Spanish force back into their fort. A tentative beachhead had been established. Soon, night had fallen, and the second phase of Cochrane's plan fell into motion. Under the cover of darkness, 250 Chilean soldiers were quickly ferried onto the beach. Guided by a captured Spaniard, they climbed the rocky bluffs onto the grassy heights upon which the fort stood. From there, the assault team split into two commands. The first approached the seaward wall of Fort Ingles, making as much noise as possible, whooping, hollering, and firing their muskets into the air while remaining out of gunfire range. They had precious little ammunition, but Cochrane knew that this bluff was crucial to his success, for the second contingent had begun circling around to the fortress's inland face. They stalked silently through the darkness, whatever sound they made drowned out by the cacophony of their comrades in front of the fort. They concealed themselves within a grove of trees, trained their sights upon the distracted Spanish soldiers on the seaward wall, and unleashed a devastating musket volley with the last of their remaining dry powder. In the ensuing chaos, the Chilean soldiers raised their bayonets and charged their enemy, screaming horrible war cries to appear all the more monstrous. The Spaniards, gripped by darkness, confusion and death, succumbed to terror and evacuated Fort Ingles, fleeing towards the neighbouring Fort Carlos. They were pursued relentlessly by Cochrane's men, who impaled the panicked royalists as they ran. As the Spanish garrison of Ingles fled towards the neighbouring Fort San Carlos, the commander of the battery frantically ordered its gates open to receive the refugees. In the shroud of night and amidst the chaos of terrorized men, the Sea Wolf's warriors slipped right in through the open doors and began hacking away at the Spaniards inside. Once more, the combined garrisons of Ingles and San Carlos abandoned the second battery and fled towards Fort Amagos. The contest continued as an almost comical game of dominoes, as Fort Amagos suffered the very same fate that San Carlos had before it. Chilean soldiers slipped through the open gates meant to bring sanctuary to their fleeing victims, and began ruthlessly hacking away at the souls within. Despite outnumbering the Chileans six to one, the Spaniards had been wholly routed by a foe who in their eyes could be no less than the devil itself. By the time Fort Amagos had been subdued, Cochrane's men had killed a hundred Spaniards and taken captive a hundred more.
they moved on to Fort Chirokomayo, which was situated inland on a hill. Unlike the three forts before it, Chirokomayo offered token resistance, but was eventually overcome by the ferocity of the Sea Wolf's marines. When the sun rose on the morning of February the 4th, four out of the seven fortresses were in Chilean hands. Absolutely stunned by this humiliating defeat, Spanish morale was at an all-time low. The fortresses on the eastern half of the harbour put up an unconvincing fight, opening fire upon the Montezuma and Intrepido as they sailed into the bay. However, when the O'Higgins reared its imposing hull within sight of Fort Niebla, the last of the Spanish resolve broke, for they believed Cochrane would shell them with the captured artillery from Fort Chirocomayo. This, compounded with the firepower and inevitable reinforcements aboard the 50-gun frigate, made further resistance futile. In reality, this was yet another bluff, for the O'Higgins had no reinforcements aboard, nor was it in any state to fight. Nevertheless, the Spaniards abandoned the eastern forts, and all of Coral Bay was now in Cochrane's hands. In total, he had lost only 26 men. Cochrane now advanced down the river to launch his assault upon the city itself, only to find that the Spanish governor had looted everything of value in his township and fled with his garrison. The city of Baldivia was now officially in Chilean hands. Despite the sacking, there was plenty of booty to be had. Bountiful amounts of arms, munitions and currency were seized from the fortresses, amounting to loot of the most promising proportions. More importantly, the last Spanish stronghold in Chile had been eliminated, eliminating the final holdout of colonial power in the south of the continent. This victory effectively secured the long-term future of Chilean independence and won them their autonomy over their coast and southern frontier. It was the greatest victory that Lord Thomas Cochrane would win on South American soil. Cochrane then returned to Valparaiso. The Chilean government had assumed he would fail in his Valdivian campaign and had preemptively prepared to court-martial him for insubordination. <laughs> Learning that he had succeeded, they quickly backpedaled and publicly honoured the Scotsman's victory. <laughs> to follow nice. up his triumph at Valdivia, Cochrane turned his attention back northwards to Peru. More specifically, the harbour of Callao, a stronghold which thus far had managed to defy him. On August 21st, 1820, the Sea Wolf departed Valparaiso at the head of the entire Chilean naval squadron. Aboard with him was the esteemed General San Jose de San Martin, alongside 4,200 of his troops, which made up the bulk of the Chilean army. Ultimately, their goal was the conquest of Lima, the Peruvian capital city that sat adjacent to Callao. Cochrane soon developed friction with San Martin. The Chilean general refused to commit his men to an all-out assault upon their main objective. Instead, he disembarked his men at various ports hundreds of miles from both Lima and Callao, stalling for weeks at a time and accomplishing very little. Believing San Martin to be of feeble military mind, Cochrane cut off from the main Chilean force and made directly for Callao with only three vessels, O'Higgins, Lautaro and Independencia. He told San Martin that he intended to blockade the port and thereby isolate Lima by sea. But this was not the truth, as Cochrane was planning something much bolder. He had suspected that the Spanish frigate Esmeralda was still anchored at Callao, and upon reaching the port, his suspicions were confirmed. To launch a frontal assault upon the coastal fortresses in the bay would be suicide, and Cochrane's previous attempts to do so had taught him as much. However, the Esmeralda was the most powerful Spanish warship on South America's Pacific coast. If he could launch a stealth assault upon the frigate and snatch her out from under the cannons of Callao, it would be a mortal blow to royalist naval power in Peru. The plan was simple in execution. Under the cover of darkness, a quiet boarding party would row into the harbour aboard small launch craft, board and subdue the crew of the Esmeralda as they slept, and make off with the prize frigate while the harbour fortress remained none the wiser. At midnight, the attack commenced. The Sea Wolf's crew embarked upon 14 canoes. They rowed harmlessly past two neutral vessels, the American Macedonia and the British Hyperion. Soon enough, the boarding skiffs reached Esmeralda. I wonder what the British and the American ships were doing there. Kind of weird. 
and began scaling its hull via the frigate's main chains. Cochrane was put in a perilous situation when the deck watchman heard the clanking of chains and raised the alarm. Esmeralda had now been alerted and the attackers had no time to waste. Cochrane heaved himself onto the deck, only to be struck upon the forehead by the butt of a sentry's musket. He fell unceremoniously back onto the skiff below, but flung himself right back upon the chains, climbing the frigate's hull once more. This time, he shot the sentry with his pistol and launched himself onto the gangway, bellowing loudly, Up, my lads, she's ours! Chileans swarmed upon the Esmeralda, routing the Spanish crew to the forecastle bow, where they rallied and unleashed a volley of musket fire upon the boarding party. Cochrane was shot in the thigh, but pressed on. The remaining Spaniards were soon routed, diving overboard or submitting to capture. The Esmeralda was in Cochrane's hands. By now, the fortress had been well alerted and began opening fire upon the captured frigate. The Seawolf's crew set to work, unfurling the sail and hastily sailing their prize out of the harbour. In yet another stroke of cunning, Cochrane ordered Esmeralda's tail lights to be raised in an identical pattern to the neutral Hyperion and Macedonia, making it indistinguishable from the two. Unable to risk firing upon neutral vessels, the Spaniards could do nothing but helplessly watch their strongest warship slip out between their fingers. The capture of the Esmeralda functionally crippled the Spanish navy west of Cape Horn. Cochrane was now the master of the coasts and proceeded to blockade Callao. The Spaniards within, now cut off entirely by both land and sea, realized that their options were to surrender or starve. After only a month, the defenders within the fortress deserted and joined the Chilean Republic. General San Martin, meanwhile, had gained little with his ground force that besieged Lima. He devoted his efforts into inciting the local native populations to rebel against the Spaniards, but that failed. Cochrane became wary of San Martin, believing that the general was deliberately keeping his army intact to seize control of the nation when it was time. Frustrated, Cochrane offered to lead the assault on Lima himself, but was denied. He then requested that the general at least lend him 600 men, which was reluctantly agreed. Cochrane took to his ships and proceeded to harass the nearby Spanish coast. The royalists in Lima had their supply lines all but shredded by the wolf's prowl, and after three months, the Spaniards' resolve finally broke, and they surrendered the city. On the 28th of July, 1821, General San Martin marched into Lima and declared the independence of the nation of Peru. On July 17th, Cochrane himself entered the newly liberated metropolis and was given a hero's welcome by the local citizenry. The Scotsman had come a long way since his fall from grace, once more reclaiming his status as a military legend. Yet with this triumph loomed the shadow of future conflict, for just as Cochrane had suspected, Jose de San Martin had been appointed the supreme protector of Peru. Old habits die hard, and the sea wolf would soon find himself butting heads with this man. But that is a story for the next episode. Uh -oh. Cochrane's story will continue soon with his service to Brazil and Greece, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. Make sure you're subscribed to my channel and you hit that button, otherwise, you know, I'm not going to release any more of these videos through kings and generals because that's me who does the narration so you know unless you know that that's a lie then oh well all right i'm gonna end this here daddy's been drinking some beer i didn't finish that last one it was garbage gives me heartburn so i'm gonna go tinkle i'm gonna tinkle a stream of urine through my ding ding and you are not gonna know about it because i'm not gonna tell you I just did.